This here is a phone I grew up with. Uh, it was in my parents' house along with about four other phones, and back then we didn't really talk on the phone much, but when we did, this one was my favorite. It looks good, it feels good in the hand, it has really, really good audio as you can hear. And a couple of years ago I was visiting my parents and I asked if I could take it since they weren't using it, and they didn't mind, so it's been kicking around my house ever since. Recently, I got curious about this manufacturer, one Northwestern Bell Phones. I'd never heard of them other than with this one phone, and Googling the name didn't really turn anything up. I even tried Googling the model number, Techline 2700S, and I get no meaningful results from Google. So I tried my fallback when this happens. I went to eBay. People will put anything on eBay, anything that they think might be rare, they'll list on there. And so you can find stuff on there that you can't find anywhere else. This can sometimes help you trace the history of a company and find things that aren't cataloged anywhere else on the entire web, so I do it a lot. I got a number of really awful looking devices, like really terrible plasticky Radio Shack phones, obviously made long after the era of the telephone was over. I found one, though, that really caught my eye. I bought it, of course, so here it is. The box has a fantastic frenetic graphic design. I don't even know what to call this style. It doesn't look like anything else I've ever seen. I think it's from the early 90s at the latest. Yeah, actually, here on the bottom, copyright 1994. Here's the actual phone itself, and I think there's a lot to like here. I mean, besides it being the weed number, it also just has this really fantastic, like, early 90s minimalist design. You know, the squared off edges, simple color palette, the buttons laid out in a grid. This, this whole thing is just kind of up my alley. I, I think it's a great looking telephone. All right, so I bought a nice looking phone on eBay. Why is that rate of video? Take a look down in this corner here, int. There's pretty much no question, that's Intercom. And that's where this phone stops making sense. Intercom means calling from one phone directly to another one, and you can't do that on a normal phone. Here's why. Here's a phone line. It's just two wires. You could call them positive and ground. I mean, phone people call them tip and ring. But it doesn't really matter because they have to act together. Any current that goes this way has to come back this way. So at any given moment, these are mirrored. So we could just talk about them as if they're only one wire. Like any conductor, this can only carry one basic element of information, a voltage. You can use that voltage to transmit information, but only one discrete piece of information at any given moment. So this wire is either at 1 volt or it's at 1.3 volts, or it's at minus 1.3 volts, but it can't be two voltages at once. Here's your basic telephone. It contains a speaker, a microphone, and a way to dial. It's connected to the wires very simply. When I want to make a call, I press these buttons and they generate sounds as oscillating voltages. They send them down this line, they go out to the phone company, and they instruct the phone company equipment who I want to call. Once the phone company connects that call, that person's voice comes back down the line as a oscillating voltage. That oscillating voltage goes through my speaker and lets me hear it, and then it goes through my microphone and my voice modulates it, and then my voice as oscillations goes back down the line in the opposite direction to the person at the other end of the call, and they're able to hear me. This is a very simple system. It's been around for about a century, and while the inner workings have changed, from the point of view of your actual telephone, it's completely unaltered. In particular, this system has never really been expanded much feature-wise for reasons way too complicated to get into right now. Now if we want to add another phone, that's not difficult. We wire it up just like the first one. Now when somebody's voice comes down the line, some of it goes to this phone, some of it goes to this phone. Both their speakers oscillate the same time, and when they speak, both their microphones modulate the voltage together. We could add a third phone, which I drew really weird for some reason. And the process works exactly the same. Every part of this system is at roughly the same electrical potential at this... Gibbs, come on. Gibbs, I will throw you out of here if I have to. Oh my god, Gibbs. This is not a good time, Gibbs. He's just gonna lay down. That's how this is. Every part of this system is at roughly the same electrical potential at the same time. The speakers, the microphones, and all three of these phones are basically at the same voltage, no matter what's going on. They can't act independently of one another. They're very simple, passive components that just do whatever the voltage coming up the line makes them do. 
There's no way for this phone to make a voltage that only this phone will see. It's just impossible. There's nowhere to put it. There's only these wires, and anything it does on this wire will be seen by both of the other phones. So how would you make a call from this phone to this phone? Well, normally, you wouldn't because it's basically impossible. Instead, you'd buy something called a PBX. Unsurprisingly, this is a PBX. God damn it. Guess I'll find that later. A PBX is basically a little phone company. This one accepts about 25 phones into this connector over here, and each one of those is essentially its own dedicated phone line. You can make a call from one of the phones attached here to any of the other phones attached here, and it doesn't have to go out to the phone company. It goes right through this thing and back out. So because none of your phones are sharing wiring, there's no problem with sending signals between them. It's the same as if you bought 25 phone lines from the phone company. It's as if you have 300 huge file cabinets. Except you're not paying for 25 phone lines. Of course, these aren't real phone lines. When you pick up a phone, you hear a dial tone that's generated internally here. And when you make a phone call, you're calling within this thing. If you want to talk to somebody out on the real phone network, you have to call out through an outside line. Outside lines plug in right over here, and when you press 9, one of these relays closes and it connects the line to your phone. This gets you the best of both worlds, but as you can see, it's not a small or a simple device, and you'd probably guess it was pretty pricey, and you wouldn't be wrong. PBXs have been around for almost as long as telephones, and they've always been very expensive. Say you're running a small business, just three or four employees and one or two phone lines, but you get a lot of calls, maybe something like a pharmacy or a video rental store. You want to be able to do things like call from the front counter to the back office, but you can't afford to buy a dedicated phone line number for every phone in the store, and you can't afford a PBX. Those things cost a fortune, and you got to pay someone to keep them running. It's overkill. You just want to make your three phones be able to talk to one another. It seems like it should be so simple. You already have the phones, you just need them to talk. This phone promises to solve that, but how? If we take a look at the back of the box, we can see that it says it supports 20 station intercom. Station is just another word for extension. All station page, which is you press a button and then you can talk over the speakerphone on all the phones at once. And three-way conferencing, which is what it sounds like. But it says that it uses standard telephone jacks, no special wiring, no master phone set, whatever that is, and no key system unit, which is another term for PBX. It also says it's PABX, and I don't want to get into what that means, but it doesn't mean this thing needs a PBX to operate. Basically, this thing claims to be the real deal. This claims to be able to offer PBX-only features that are impossible with a normal phone, but with nothing other than a normal phone line. So how does it do it? As we established, a wire can only have one voltage on it at a time. But there's nothing that says that voltage has to be a simple waveform. Consider the following. You can take this waveform and this waveform and add them together. And it produces something like this. It doesn't take particularly sophisticated electronics to do this, nor does it take sophisticated ones to get the original two signals back out. This always seemed impossible to me, but it's a thing we've been doing for like over a century at this point, and it's one of the most fundamental concepts in signal processing, so I have to accept that it's possible, but it still always just weirded me out that it was. Critical thing though, in order to separate these, the signals have to be in different frequencies. They can't be too close together or they'll just mash into each other and you won't be able to separate them again. So let's define a signal. The human voice is a signal consisting of audio frequency variations. Audio frequency is between about zero and 22 kilohertz or so. So human voice is a signal that's oscillating at up to 22,000 times a second. Although, because the phone system is very, very old and the human voice doesn't need that much bandwidth, all telephones are hard limited to only operate at about 8 kilohertz. Your phone line's limited to that as well, so that's the only signal you can get through a phone line. Up to 8,000 oscillations per second. Now you could try and combine one human voice and another human voice, but if you add this one to this one, what you get out is what sounds like just another human voice, just a confusing one. The two signals are combined and there's no way to separate them. The frequencies are so close together, the information about which oscillation came from which waveform is just lost. So how does this phone get two signals onto one line without this happening? How can the phones tell the signals apart? If there's 20 stations that are all talking to each other at once, there's got to be a way to tell the signals apart, otherwise they'd all hear each other. And on top of that, you have to have other signals in there. Not just the voice, you have to have signals that say, for instance, when there's a paging call coming in. 
None of these are concepts that exist in telephony, so you can imagine when I saw this on eBay, I was pretty confused. A friend found a manual, not for this one, but for a similar one that appeared to have the same technology, and it contained this very interesting page. It says that all the phones have to share the same line one, and that that line can't be more than 600 feet long. The second page also said there can't be any DSL filters between the phones, and that's when it clicked. If you don't remember dial-up internet, it sucked. You couldn't be on the phone and on the internet at the same time, and the reason for that is because your modem was making a phone call out to your ISP in order to get you on the internet. Your modem sent your data from your PC. This is not where the phone line goes. The phone line plugs in between the modem and the phone company. Your modem turns the series of bits from your computer into a miserable analog screeching noise that's then sent down your phone company and over to your ISP, and they turn it back into a series of ones and zeros. Now, of course, you can't have a phone call while this is going on because, one, the line's tied up by the call your modem had to make to the ISP. And even if it wasn't, your voice is in the same frequency range as the modem. So if you pick up the phone and talk, you'll break your internet connection because your voice signals are interpreted by the ISP as data. And, of course, you couldn't talk anyway because you're listening to that horrible screaming in your ear. DSL fixed this. DSL still does the same thing. It takes your data from your PC and it turns it into an analog waveform, but it does it at an incredibly high frequency. This frequency is so high that if you make a phone call, your voice can go out over the line at the much lower frequencies of a human voice, and these two signals don't interfere with each other. You don't hear the DSL modem because it's up in the megahertz. And the DSL modem doesn't get interfered with by your voice because you're down the lowly kilohertz. The DSL modem is busy with much more important things. You also don't have to dial out to your ISP, but that's a side effect. That's because with DSL, there's an extra piece of equipment called a D-SLAM, which you can't read. The D-SLAM strips off the high-frequency signal from your DSL modem and sends it to your ISP directly. Meanwhile, your telephone signal goes into the phone company's normal phone switch. Because they're different frequencies, they can be separated easily. These phones must use the same concept. I mean, there's no other way really to get two signals on one wire, so they've got to be using something like that. But there's other clues here that confirm this theory. The limit on line length, for instance. At low frequency is like 8 kilohertz. When you send a signal down a wire, it gets to the other end, and there's a certain amount of reflection that comes back. Now, I'm not very much of an electrical engineer, but my understanding is that at lower frequencies, that reflection either peters out, or it comes back in such perfect sync that it doesn't interfere with the original waveform. Either way, it's not that big of a problem. At higher frequencies, though, when you send a signal down a wire, that signal has a tendency to bounce and come back the other direction. When this happens, you get the two signals being mixed, but in opposite phases and out of sync. Again, this is a very rough way to describe it, but this phenomenon does happen. So the line length limit definitely tells us that there's more than 8 kHz signals being sent down the lines. The mention of DSL filters, though, is even more significant. There's something that people found out when they invented DSL, which is that some telephones don't know what the hell to do with this signal. So the DSL is trying to send its signal only to the DSLAM, but as I established earlier, that signal has to go everywhere to every device that's connected to your phone wiring. So obviously, it's going to get sent back up here and up to your phone. Now, if you have a very old phone and that phone is made with very old components, that might not be a problem. If it's just a very simple one where it literally has just a speaker, a microphone, and very little else, this will probably be okay. But suppose instead that you have some much newer phone, maybe something made in the 2000s. This isn't that, but I didn't have a prop. When this signal makes its way back up the line and runs into that phone, there's no telling what's going to happen. Old phones didn't have very complicated circuitry in them, but new ones have things like high-sensitivity transistor amplifiers with very high bandwidth. So when this signal makes its way back up to the phone, what's going to happen? Well, the circuitry in the phone could actually start to oscillate and send that signal back out onto the line, or it could resonate and produce harmonic frequencies that it sends out onto the line. Either way, the signal bounces back to the DSL modem and screws it up. It doesn't damage it, but it makes a hash of your data signal, and you'll lose your connection or at least start losing speed. The solution to this is to install a DSL filter. If you've had DSL internet at any point, you probably recognize this thing and wondered what the hell it does, because they don't seem to be necessary and they don't seem to harm anything. They don't seem to do anything at all, really. Well, I broke this one open so I can show you what's in there. This is a very simple circuit, just a couple resistors, capacitors, and some inductors, and it forms a low-pass audio filter. Uh, in other words, this strips down any signal that comes into it to just 8 kilohertz. What else? When you install this between the phone and the phone jack, when the DSL signal tries to go back up that line, it gets stopped by the filter. 
Since the high frequency signal can't make its way to the phone, it can't bounce back, can't interfere with your DSL, and everyone's happy. So that tells us again these phones must use signals that are outside of the 8 kHz voice band. I mean, again, there's no other explanation, but it's still interesting putting the clues together. Now, I couldn't find any more of these to test with, but I was able to find another phone that uses the same technology at my local junk store. Now, this one isn't compatible with that one, but I do have another one that it is compatible with. These are obviously quite a bit newer, but they offer much the same feature set per the box, and they're operating under the same limitations. They use completely ordinary phone lines and don't require any central PBX. They do, however, require external power. Unlike this phone, which runs entirely off the line, these ones won't operate without a power brick. So I've powered them both up, and they're both connected to a pair of simulated phone lines on a voice over IP adapter. They work pretty much exactly like normal phone lines, but they're a little different, and that will come into play in a moment. These phones have been on for a bit now, and you'll notice that this one shows the time and date, which is wrong, but it means it's ready for a call. Whereas this one just says, please wait. That please wait means that they're trying to find each other. They're sending their signals out onto the wire and trying to figure out which other telephone sets are available. The fact that this one still says please wait after two minutes means that it's having trouble doing that. I know why it's doing this and I can fix it, but this does help illustrate something about how these function. All right, I swapped cables and they finally settled now and now I can show you what's going on. I can make an ordinary telephone call and that works all right. I won't find out till I go to edit the video, but I'm guessing that it sounds like crap. This phone doesn't feel very good in the hand and it doesn't seem like it's very well made, but I'm able to make a call. And as you can see, line one here is lit up on both phones. So they're both aware that the line is in use. But now let's try and use one of the advanced features. I'm gonna try and make an intercom call from station one to station two. Oops, no answer, but this never even rang. Let's try doing the opposite from station two to station one. Well, it rings, but let's pick up. No answer, but I did answer. So what's going on here? Well, I happen to know. This whole business with the high frequency signals is what's going on. But what's funny about it is that in my case, it's reversed. In this situation, the problem is the DSL modem is creating a signal that a phone can't handle. But in my situation, it's the phones themselves making a high frequency signal, and it's the line that can't handle it. See, my voice over IP adapter over here doesn't work exactly like a real phone line. It's very close, but much like newer telephones, when it receives a high frequency signal, it's not really designed for it. There's never supposed to be a high frequency signal coming in those jacks, so they didn't test for that. So when these things are sending out whatever high frequency signals they're using, they're hitting that thing, resonating, and then confusing the phones. All we have to do to fix it is install a DSL filter. Both phones came up right away, and now I can make intercom calls. And here we are. I'm holding the handset right up against the microphone so you can hear the audio quality of the intercom. It doesn't sound very good to me. These handsets are really uncomfortable, and I think anybody who had to work at a store that used these would probably curse their name. But nonetheless, it does work. And now I can show you the boring functionality of completely ordinary business telephones. You saw I can make a call. I can do an intercom call. When I'm on a call, I can transfer it. And I can receive the transfer and I can page. The paging works well enough. I'm now talking over the speakerphone of this phone here. If I had five phones, I would be talking over all of them at once. Just like the phone system at every business you've ever worked at. Now, of course, we didn't expect these to be exciting in the way they functioned. What's interesting is just that they can function without the thing that you never knew was there, the PBX in the back room. So obviously they function, and that probably isn't super exciting unless you're a huge phone nerd. Whether you are or aren't, I do want to show you what's going on under the hood, because it's actually pretty fascinating. I'm not great at interpreting all the signals these things send, but I think I can show you a couple that point towards how they operate. Where the hell is the probe? There's the probe. I brought all this mess out here because we can get to the individual wires of the phone line here. I'm going to clip on to, actually, line 2 which is not where the magic happens. This is so that you can see what an ordinary phone call looks like. This is dial tone. It's a combination of, I think, 440 and 350 something hertz. It's a pretty regular waveform. And if we zoom in here, you can see it's just a sine wave mixed with another sine wave. It's kind of hard to see, but that's what's going on. Now I'm gonna dial some digits. This is a digit being dialed. If we zoom in here, you'll be able to see that there's two different frequencies going on here. There's one pair of frequencies that means two and one that means five and so on. You can hear these, of course. When you dial, you can hear them in your ear. And with the 
phone off the hook, you can see the frequencies that represent the sound of my speaking voice. These are, again, within our normal audible range. If you look in the lower left, you'll see that most of the frequencies show up as 100 hertz, 50 hertz, and so on, way below that 8,000 hertz limit. Now I'm going to put my probe on line one. I'm not going to actually pick up the line because that would put dial tone on it again. We want to look at a signal that's being sent over the line that's not part of a normal phone call. So I'm going to press intercom and select station one. And there is a signal there that's about 1.3 kilohertz. I'm not exactly sure what it means. I tried sending calls from that phone to this one and this one to that one, and I, I couldn't seem to get consistent frequencies. So what's most likely is that this is not like a specific frequency that means intercom call to station one, but really this is a carrier frequency of some kind that gets modulated to send instructions. Now I'm going to actually complete the intercom call. With the intercom call active, if we zoom in here, we'll see something quite distinct. To me, this appears to be an amplitude modulated audio signal. If we zoom in further, it'll inform us that this frequency is around 400 kilohertz. So that's definitely outside the range of human hearing, and I think that my voice is being modulated onto that. Now I can't really like talk into it and demonstrate that. Like I can talk into it, but you don't really see any change in the waveform. Uh, I don't think you can read AM on an oscilloscope easily, but I'm pretty sure that's what this is, and it fits all of my assumptions and guesswork about this, so I'm comfortable with that explanation. If anybody knows better and wants to tell me in the comments whether you agree that this is an AM modulated audio signal, I would appreciate it. I'd like to confirm that but it just makes the most sense to me and I'm pretty sure that's what AM looks like. If it is amplitude modulated audio, then everything here makes perfect sense. It explains how they're able to do 20 calls over the same phone line at the same time. It's the same way your radio is able to get multiple stations even though you only have one wire going into your antenna. If this call is at 400 kilohertz, another one might be at 415 kilohertz, another one at 420 kilohertz, nice. And each one could be easily stripped apart by tuning within the phone just like an AM radio tunes into a particular station. This technique is formally called frequency division multiplexing, but we've been doing it for like a century, so we can just call it, you know, the way radio works, tuning. It's the same concept. TV works that way, radios work that way, your cell phone works that way. These are really remarkable devices. The concept is so simple, it could have been accomplished in the 70s, like almost as soon as the transistor was invented. So I'm kind of surprised it didn't come out earlier. And in fact, from my research, it does certainly look like these existed in the late 80s, and a ton of companies ended up making their own versions of them. So I'm really floored that I've never heard of this technology, and neither has anybody else that I've described it to. These devices are even still sold. The AT&T Model 1080 is available to electronics retailers now for about $150, and it includes even more features than these ones, like voicemail and an auto attendant. That's the thing that says press 1 for sales, press 2 for billing, and then routes you to the right person. They look like reasonably decent devices, probably better than these ones. The principle seems sound, so if you have a need for this sort of thing, I guess you could buy some. You could even save some money and buy some of the older models off of eBay. There's plenty on the used market if you know how to find them. Keep an eye out for a link I'm going to put in the description with a lot more information about these things. I found a ton of interesting dirt on them, but a lot of it didn't really fit in a video format, so I had to cut this down to just the stuff I thought you'd enjoy. So let me know if you enjoyed it. For my part, I'm just glad I can finally get rid of these awful telephones. I don't really need them, they're just more gadgets that I couldn't resist buying just to make a video about. So they'll be going back to the junk store, which is more like a rental store to me at this point. If you want to see more weird stuff like this, though, consider throwing me a few bucks on my coffee or subscribing to my Patreon, and I'll try to put your money towards the strangest things I can find on eBay. For now, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.